Well, thank you so much for your worship through giving today. Connected to Jesus is our series. It's a four-week series. This is installment number two. I want to tell you, I am grateful for Ashley Hofstrand's participation last week in telling her story. And I hope, as Pastor Marco mentioned, that many return to last week's service or to the clip that was posted this week. They both are a powerful testimony to what Jesus can do. And today, another Bible character and another special guest to be interviewed. Well, let me start today and talk a little bit about contrasts. Contrasts. You know, looking at history, people often talk, for example, about how Thomas Jefferson was a man of contrast. Here was a man who wrote beautifully about freedom and about equality, and yet he owned slaves. He always loved solitude and the countryside, and yet he spent his whole life in crowded cities working on politics. In literature, contrast helps the reader see the attributes of each thing in the pair. A blue sky looks even more blue when you put it next to an orange bonfire. And the bonfire looks more orange when it is contrasted with the blue of the sky. And similarly, a kind character looks even more kind next to a cruel villain. And a cruel villain ends up looking even more cruel next to the kind person, and so on, and so on, and so on. Contrasts are often compelling to read because they do simplify things in some ways. Once you know that one character is brave and the other character is a coward, well, it, it makes it a little bit more easy to predict their actions, and that could make any story easy to read. But at the same time, contrasts can make room for all sorts of complexities. I want to point out a contrast in a parable that Jesus told in Luke chapter 18. Now, today, I'm going to be reading out of the message translation, just because I believe it adds a little bit more color, some other shades to the stories about the individuals we are reading about. Luke chapter 18, starting at verse 9. Jesus told his next story to some who were complacently pleased with themselves over their moral performance and looked down their noses at common people. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax man. Now, I'll just stop right there. Pharisees, the height of religion. A tax man, some of the lowest and most despised in that community. The Pharisee posed and prayed like this, Oh God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, crooks, adulterers, or heaven forbid, like this tax man. I fast twice a week and tithe on all my income. And meanwhile, the tax man slumped in the shadows, his face in his hands, not even daring to look up, said, God, give me mercy. Forgive me, a sinner. Jesus commented, this tax man, not the other, went home made right with God. If you walk around with your nose in the air, you're going to end up flat on your face. 
But if you're content to simply be yourself, you will become more than yourself. What what an amazing contrast that Jesus draws in this parable. The Pharisee and the tax collector. You know, it is interesting to me that this attitude of superiority is still prevalent in the world of the church today. One with a church background, maybe even a ministry background, feeling superior to someone without their spiritual pedigree or their supposed maturity, who is actually blinded to their own lack of true relationship with Jesus and in need of a true relationship with Jesus. I want to say to you today, even righteous-looking and sounding people need a life-transforming encounter with Jesus. Who's up on the table for us to look at today? I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to Acts Chapter 9, we will occupy our attention in Scripture today with verses 1 through 22. Because this passage contains what is perhaps the greatest transformation story in the entire Bible. Maybe even the greatest transformation story in Christian history. It's the story of the transformation of Saul, who became Paul. Saul was a righteous man, but not until he personally encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus was his life forever changed. Now, I know if you've been in church any length of time, You've probably heard Paul's story. He's introduced to us earlier in Acts as the man who is holding the coats of the people who are stoning Stephen to death. And the passage that is opened before us in Acts chapter 9 reminds us that this Saul who we know as Paul, was making murderous threats against the ancient followers of Jesus. And in a radical encounter, there were other people around. He wasn't by himself. Read through these verses. I don't have full time to do that today. Read through these verses. There were others that heard what was going. They just couldn't see what was happening. And Paul got up a changed man and a murderous enemy of this new Christian movement becomes the greatest advocate for Jesus the world perhaps has ever known. I mean, isn't it interesting that you can find Luke calling Paul an evil man? But but his encounter with Jesus transformed an evil, misguided, blinded, arrogant man into a humble servant of Jesus. What do we know about Paul? Well, Paul was a Jew who grew up in a Pharisee's home. He was taught this life As a child, and when older, Paul sat under the teaching of the most influential Jewish teacher of his day, Gamaliel. Look, folks, Paul knew the Old Testament inside and out. He was considered among the most righteous of the righteous. And on the day that we find him in Acts chapter 9, we find him on a mission from God, or so he thought. 
And here we find a person. Righteous and holy as he was. In need of transformation. So what was going on? What was up in Paul's life? That God needed to get his attention in such a drastic way? Well first. There was a problem with Paul's faith. You see Paul had all the trappings of religion. He knew the codes. He knew the rules. He, he knew what he should do, what he shouldn't do, uh, dietary-wise, uh, work-wise, whatever it was. Paul knew the codes, the, the behavior of holy people. He had it down pat. He just didn't have a relationship. What I want to say to you today is that this can happen to a lot of folks who have been raised up in church for many years. Because what they know of faith is inherited from the time that they were little. The faith of my family, the church that my family Attends. I know to do this. I don't do this. I, 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 am, I am living out an inherited, kind of engrafted way of doing things. But it's not a personal faith. Friends, that, that's my story. Uh, I was a good little boy. I, I was a good church boy. I could give you chapter and verse. I've joked about this before because we used to do a little thing called Bible drills where, you know, a teacher would ask a question in the first, divide it into teams, and then great, we're going we're, we're gonna to war over who knows the Bible better. I'm going to tell you, you needed Steve Yeary on your team. Hand straight. I knew it. I would if, if, if those Bible sword drills were jeopardy today, I would have been a grand national champion. But I remember the day that my maternal grandmother set me down as a teenager and said, you know, Steve, you know a lot, but have you really had an encounter with Jesus? You see, Steve had down the rules, the regulations. I knew the behavior I knew when to put my hands up, I knew when to sing, I knew when to drop some coins in the, in the offering plate, I knew, how to, I knew how to respond in the right way, uh, whether or not I was feeling it or not. I mean, I inherited a behavior. But relationship was not to be found. Now, it's interesting in this story that when Paul is knocked down by the Lord, he asks perhaps the most transformative question any of us could ever ask God. Who are you, Lord? Who are you? This is a deeply personal question. And when Jesus answered him, I'm Jesus, the one who you are persecuting. Paul realized something. Huh? This isn't the God I've known before. This, this isn't the God that I have supposedly been serving. Because in Paul's life, at least up to this moment, God was a list of do's and don'ts, rules, regulations, ceremonies, festimo, uh, festivals, on and on it goes. But in one powerful, transformative moment, Paul encountered the person of Jesus. You know, what's interesting in the story is that when Paul gets up from the ground after this encounter, he's blind. His companions need to lead him into the city. He's blind. And in, and, in an, and in a remarkable series of events, 
you see someone going to one of the followers of Jesus who knew about Paul, who knew about his murderous intent, and said, hey, I want you to know that Paul had a dream, and you need to go to this man. He's a man from Tarsus. Here's a house where he's staying. You need to go, and you need to bring him back. And of course, there's an argument right there. Listen, if I knew that there was a massive persecutor out ready to kill me and my family or whatever for just simply following Jesus, you know what? Some of our very first things, we're going to go into hiding. And then somehow I, I get a word from the Lord that tells me I'm supposed to go find that guy. Oh, come on, Pastor Marco. I'm going to be having a, I'm going to be having a talk with God. Well, he has his little talk with God. And God said, nope, you're going to go do this. And so he does. And when he lays his hands on Paul, the story says something like scales fell off of his eyes and he could see again. But that's not even the most remarkable thing. Immediately. Now, I wonder. I wonder, special guest. I wonder, Pastor Marco. I wonder, Pastor Marty, I wonder, Pastor Randy, I wonder, Brother Roger, I wonder what Paul, what was running through Paul's mind during the three years, the three days that he was blinded, had to be brought his food. That great mind, can you imagine? Can you imagine what he was thinking about? And then here's this parallel Vision, dream, word from the Lord that, that comes to both and Ananias and comes to Paul. There is a meeting up. Scales fall off of his eyes. What does Paul do immediately? He starts proclaiming Jesus as the Messiah. Immediately, he goes to work proclaiming Jesus as Messiah. What a story. And then we know the rest. Most of the New Testament that we read today, we wouldn't have if it wasn't for the anointed pen under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, the anointed pen of the Apostle Paul. Pastor Marco, his wife Amber, I have had the privilege of walking through those cities that Paul went to and wrote to. And when you realize the depth and the breadth of how God used this man, you have to say, you know what, outside of Jesus, this guy's story is remarkable. A good man, a religious man, still needed a life-transforming encounter with Jesus. So I want to say to all of us today, you can grow up a good person. You can know all the rules and all the regulations of faith. You can even involve yourself in a humanitarian-focused job. You can give money to the right place. You can be a good person church-going person, doing good things, but you still need transformation. You need. We all need a life-changing encounter with the living Jesus. I'm going to ask you today, have you had that moment in your life where you encountered Jesus in a powerful way? Have you had that moment when you personally have transitioned from an inherited faith to a personal faith in Jesus Christ? Folks, this, this thing that we live in, that we are called to, that we, we, we live as a witness of and a demonstration of, 
It's got to go. What's that? Maybe about eight. It's got to go from here. It's got to get down in here. I remember the day that my oldest daughter, Lauren, freaked me out as a dad. Oh, my goodness. I had to go talk to one of my mentors. I remember the day that Lauren, what was she, Marty, what? Maybe about 15 or 16. I remember the day that just out of the blue, well, this was Lauren, just out of the blue, Dad, Mom, I want you to know, I don't love Jesus because you love Jesus. I love Jesus because I love Jesus. And I want you to know, my first response was, have you seen that little emoji that goes, I ran to one of my mentors. Oh, my goodness. And I mean, I was looking at Lord. Did, did, did you really doubt? Did you really? And my, and my mentor, lovingly, dear Dave Gable, he, he always called me Yuri. Yuri, you just got a glimpse that many do not glimpse in their children's lives. You just heard your daughter's confession that she moved from an inherited faith to a personal faith in Jesus. Every one. You may have a good daddy and a good mommy. They might be a deacon in a church. They might sing on the worship team. They might work in other ministries and whatever. And you might say, oh, I've grown up in a Christian home. Wonderful! But do you need to meet the living Jesus today. Well, time to meet a guest. Very familiar to some, but it might be new to many of you. Tim Williams is a Sunday morning fixture in ministry. He's taught our adult Sunday school class for a whole lot of years now. Um, I'm usually here early. Tim usually gets here quite early. We have wonderful conversations on Sunday morning. I, I've been missing those. He's drinking a, a Starbucks tea, and I've got a cup of coffee. And we compare books that we've been reading, rabbit trails that we've been on uh, of learning, and uh, we have shared some good life over the last decade. Tim is married to Samantha. He teaches choir at Liberty High School and raises championship corgi dogs. Why did I invite Tim today? Well, Tim was raised in a missionary and a pastor's home. He's also one of my best red friends. And can I get somebody to grab my, my, my little teaching stool right here? And I want Tim Williams to come on up here today and join me, and we're going to have a conversation. How you doing, my friend? I'm doing okay. Are you doing okay? I'm doing okay. Yeah, starting classes tomorrow. Yes. In an unusual format. Absolutely. You're not being able to do what you do best. No, and as I said earlier, uh, this is the first year in 22 years that I feel like I have a job. That you have a job. Uh, because um, I love what I do so much. Yeah. That when I, uh, I get up in the morning when school starts, I'm so excited. I can't get up early enough. I'm, I'm excited to be there. And so this year, I'm really working on loving what I do. There you go. Yes. There, you know what? I think all of us here would say in the format that we're doing right now, because the energy that you, you just gain from just being around people and talking face to face with people and their response, um, you know, that, that's, that's just... That's just so important. And you know what? Reconnecting with joy, uh, embracing, because, you know, we could sit around and gripe all we want to about, well, I don't like this, and this just, well, and you know what? I do not like this way, but I'm glad we have a way yes, to yes. be able to stay connected. So here we are, connected to Jesus. Why don't you tell all of us today how you got connected to Jesus? Okay, well, at first I had no choice. <laughs> um, um, my my uh, my parents were missionaries to Mexico, uh, church planters. Yes. And um, so, as a consequence, I have probably been baptized in any kind of body of water you can imagine, <laughs> um, as a sample. 
you know, as a so, sample. So my it. dad would say, well, I need to baptize someone, and I don't want them to think it's a real thing until they've done it. So I want to show you how it's done. And, and he would show pastors that he was training how to baptize. And so I had been baptized in streams, in culverts, in, in uh, canals, in bathtubs, in swimming pools, in foot washing basins. Wow. Um, um, I think probably a few mud puddles. Yes. Uh, rivers of questionable quality. Um, um, and uh, so, uh, you know, I could say I've probably been baptized hundreds of times. You must be cleaner than oh, most of us. Oh, you know it. And, and so I grew up, you know, uh, in church, uh, always in Sunday school, doing all the things you talked about. Um, and then uh, there came a day, uh, pretty much in my teens, 15, 16 years old, I started to question whether I was a believer in God or whether I was just doing what my dad told me to do. Mm. Or, and, and my dad had told me many years before that. He says, I'll believe this. I believe you are a Christian. I believe you're a follower of Jesus when you do it without having to. Great, great statement. Yeah. And, you know, and, and a lot of people at that point, they say, okay, well, bye. <laughs> right. Um, and, and I want to say that um, for a long time, I did what I was told because I'm trying to be good. Right. But there came a point where I just said, you know what? I need to figure this out for myself. And I suddenly I could drive. And so I thought, okay, how can I test this faith of mine? And so what I did is I, I asked some of my friends where they went to church. So I knew went to church. And some of them went out to Arvin Assembly of God with okay. Pastor Palm. Yeah. And so I started going on uh, Wednesday nights to their youth group. And um, I went because I had friends. Um, and I got to tell you, the transformation that happened there is, uh, am I allowed to call people's names out? Sure you okay. are. I'm, I'm so thankful to Terry and Jerry Heron who caught me. Members of this congregation right now, yeah. I needed to be caught. And I needed to be called on some of my dumb attitudes and my cynicism that I developed over time with church. Yeah. And uh, so I went and I hung out with my friends, but I was Mr. Know-it-all because I had been raised. You know, I was, I was probably in fourth grade, and my dad would throw open the Bible and say, explain this to me. Oh, my word. I'd say, yeah. He said, okay, well, this is the book of Revelations. This is the chapter. Okay, tell me what he's saying here. And he wouldn't let me off the hook. I had to explain it. I was not done until I had totally explained the context, the culture, uh, maybe some of the Greek. Uh, you know, Help but, me, Lord. Yeah, and, and that was just how I was raised. And so I knew everything, you know, quote, unquote, everything. And so me in a youth group, I was insufferable. Just like me. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and, and Terry and, and Jerry Heron, they, they called me on that, and, and, and I appreciate them. And I can't, I, I mean, I still pray for them, and I still think about them because they changed my life mm. because their faithfulness. And, uh, you know, so I'm very thankful to them for that. Um, I came, when I came here, I didn't know they came here. And I was so, so excited when I saw them. I, I probably acted like an idiot. But, okay. Uh, <laughs> but I just, uh, and, and what happened is there, and, and I started going on Sunday mornings, and, and I, I found a love of Jesus um, there. And, and it, it may have been the ministry, but I just needed to isolate from my family. And the truth is, it mm. really hurt my parents. It hurt yeah. my parents' heart when I wasn't going to church with them um, because they kind of needed me. I was a little worker. Mm -hmm. um, but I needed to do it. And there came a day when suddenly I realized, you know what, this is real. I love Jesus, and I'm going to serve him. And I went back to my dad's church. Hmm. And I immediately started serving in the official capacity, leading worship, dealing with the youth. And I never stopped. Um, um, I mean, I, when I came to this church, I think it was 10 or 11 years ago, yeah. I had been a youth pastor with my dad's church up until a week before I came here. Wow. And I remember coming to this church and coming in and feeling very, very comfortable. But then I thought to myself, but can I serve here? Is there, this is such a nice big church with so many good people. Maybe I'm not necessary here. And I, I, and I remember uh, I said to myself, okay, God, I'll sit in the pew. These aren't pews, but I'll sit in the chairs. And I'll do what you want me to do, um, whatever. Um, but I'd kind of like to do something. Right. And then not maybe two weeks later, you called me and said, hey, can we meet? And I thought, okay, maybe I'm going to be asked to do something. And I'll never forget the prayer I prayed on the way to meet you at Starbucks. Okay, God. I will do 
anything you ask me to do with this church. I'll clean toilets. I'll scrub the floors. I'll do anything. Please don't make me work with little kids. <laughs> God, if you want me to, I will, but please don't. <laughs> but please don't. <laughs> please, please, please don't. My prayer was, Lord, don't send me to Africa. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, 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 and fortunately, I was, you asked me to teach the, the adult Sunday school class, and, and that has been such a blessing, um, and uh, I really do appreciate that, the opportunity. But, you know, that, that transformation that happened when I was around 16, 17 years so old. Do you, so was it, was it a, a gradual dawning on you, or did you have a moment, do you think? I think it was a gradual yeah, thing. Yeah, um, yeah. It just, and, and you know, uh, we'll, we'll talk about habits later. Sure, But Because yeah. uh, I, I just got up and got to church. I mean, that's what you do. Right. I mean, and I just got up and went to a different church. Right, right. And then one day I got up and went back to my church. Right. Which was my dad's right. church. Right. But, but in that time of, in, in a sense, moving away from the inherited, that this is what we always do. Yeah. There was still that moment there that in that uh, time of maybe God-ordained isolation that you, you had a moment where you said, no, this is mine. I think in my case, it wasn't an, in, an incident of scales falling off, but more an incident of bricks being chipped off of my mm. eyes. Mm. And, and so like there was this gradual dawning that this is a real thing. And I believe I had a genuine experience with God as a young child. Right. And I think it was real. But there were many, many, and there still are to this day, moments where I come back. Yes. And I come back to the altar. I'm not being re-saved. Right. But I am, I am coming back to that altar. And, I, and, and, and you know, this has been hard with this. It's, I, yes. I, I have to force myself to come back to the altar, which happens to be my living room, and then get licked in the face by my little short dog. Because <laughs> if I'm on the ground, yeah, they You're can reach love. me. Yeah, they can they reach get me. You. Yeah, so that's yeah. So 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 again, what? So uh, we, we talk about that, and yes, you were a worker. What what would you what would you say that at, at in that period of life when you you went more from inherited to personal? What what were some things that you feel were were really transformed in your life? Well, the ownership. Oh, the ownership issue. The okay. ownership of my walk. And Pastor Palm was really good about highlighting that, is that, that this, is, this has to be yours. Yes. Your relationship. And, and, and it's still something I struggle with a little bit today, and, and, but it, it's that concept of a relationship versus a, uh, uh, well, an interchange. Like, I get this for this. Okay. And, yeah. and, 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 and it isn't that. Um, and, and when you're young, you don't understand. Oh, if you go to the store, you, you buy something with money and you get candy or whatever. And, but God isn't that. Um, and realizing that, that my faith was based on my relationship with God rather than what I do for him, what he does for me. Got it. And, and that certainly was a transformation. Did you see a change in your in your prayer, or your worship, or oh, your absolutely. appreciation of the word, or anything? Oh, absolutely! It, it became the a lot of the why. Why do I do what I do? Mm. And I'm not going to tell you I don't still struggle with that. Oh, wow. um, the the why do I read the Bible? Why do I pray? Why do I get up and go to church on Sunday morning, or whatever it is I do? Why do I witness? Why, why do I do what I do? Um, you know, as a young child, because I had all this Bible knowledge, I was the biggest bully spiritually you could imagine hmm. those poor jehovah's witness kids in my classes oh, oh my word uh, making the poor mormon missionaries cry at the door <laughs> um i could do that Damn. oh no <laughs> no i was i was i was going, you needed jesus brother <laughs> i i needed jesus and 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 learning that jesus doesn't need me to defend him mm. uh, was a big thing uh, but i was a bully i was i was very much a bully um, and so, you know, I had to learn to let that go. Wow. And, and, and let Jesus fight those fights. Well, tell me then, you know, um, how did, how did this, this transformation affect your closest relationships? Grace. Oh. Um, now, later, I learned that I could have grace, too. <laughs> Right. That yeah. grace could be aimed back at me, yes. which that's important. But yes. I, I, and, and I'm, st I mean, I'm, st I'm not there, 
Um, I'm, I'm, on a, I'm on a voyage, just like we all are in our faith. But, but I found that when I let God transform me, when I let the Holy Spirit work in me, I can extend grace to other people for all their stupid errors, <laughs> no. for their stupid yeah. beliefs, for their, you know, I, all, and I'm, I'm joking, obviously, but you understand that I, I had to learn to offer the grace to others that they had, that God had offered to me, and including younger Christians. Oh. What do you mean you don't know who Nicodemus is? What do you don't you don't know what a Pharisee is, loser? No, right. I had to learn that that. Uh, well, you could have said, "Well, just look at me; you'll see a Pharisee." Right, right, no doubt. But but learning that learning that you know we're all on different places. Yeah. And and the the analogy I remember is that we used to get together with my family. My family are all church people. They love to sing, and there were lots of little singing groups in my church and. We'd get together at my grandma's house, and we all sing. They'd be sitting around the living room singing, singing, singing. And then they'd say to the kids, all right, you sing. And some of the kids would get up and sing. And we were awful because <laughs> little kids can't sing. They can't. But you know what? No one ever said, stop it. You're right. terrible. Stop singing. They let me sing. And I, I had to give that same grace to fellow Christians and to people who were lost. Isn't that amazing? I mean, I'm, I'm sorry to yeah. interrupt. I, I yeah. mean, but... I'm sitting here and I'm listening to that and I'm reliving <laughs> decades of my own life where I was, I, forgive me God for the years of being a judgmental Pharisee yeah. with people that I felt should know better and had disobeyed God and obviously they were cut out for, for, for judgment and, and set on the sidelines and, 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 and all those other things that, that get you out of the game. And yet going back and realizing that in my life, like yours, it was the people of Jesus that believed in me, that loved me, that said, you can do this when I didn't think I could do it myself. Absolutely. And yet I, oh, I've, I've, I've marveled over that today and am just so grateful that at some point in my own journey that grace, rather than judgment, began to be a primary quality of my walk with Jesus. And so that grace to extend, that, that grace to, to nurture, that grace to, to reach. I mean, that's a work, though, too, isn't it? I mean, oh. it wasn't boom, boom. Oh, no. It was done. Right. It's informed my teaching. You know, I, I, you could probably talk to a lot of people who, when they were little kids, some music teacher says, oh, you can't be in choir because you don't know how to sing. Right. And that hurts my heart now. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and so I don't say that to anybody ever again. And, and uh, you know, what's funny about that was I was in high school, and I was a terrible singer. I was really terrible. Really? Yes. I didn't learn how to sing till college. I fell in love with it in college. I mean, I, I loved to sing before, and I sang in church, but I didn't know how to sing. I was wrong. I couldn't read music. I was off, off key. And I learned in college, but I had a high school teacher who lied to me <laughs> and said I could do it. And, uh, and, and that's, so that, that, that's a grace. Wow, is it ever. Yeah, and I needed that, you so needed I re-extended it. Yes, and then to extend it to others. Yeah. Isn't the work of Jesus in our lives such an amazing thing? Yeah. yeah. All I know, and we've talked about this many times, when I realize what I have been given, it sure humbles me even more. Yeah. How can I not extend to others what has been so freely extended to me? Wow. Yeah. Transformation. Do you, do, you, do you feel like you're still in the process of transformation? <laughs> I mean, no, but I'm just saying, look, okay, you're, you're, you're a mature man. You've got a great career. You've, you've walked with Jesus. You've talked about it. But, but, but do you feel like you're done? Oh, heavens, no. And, I mean, every time I meet new people, I, I have to relearn that. I have to reoffer that grace, and I have to and, – and then, and then to put it back on myself, for my mistakes – and, you know, I, uh, as a young Christian, I haunted myself with my past mm. sins yeah. and my past attitudes. And I could go back, you know, as a young youth pastor and look back at some of the things I said to kids as oh, a youth pastor. 
I, I, I'm embarrassed. Help us, I'm Lord. embarrassed, and I, I, I can't go back in time, and I can't beat myself up, and so I have to offer myself grace. Do you know that's been one of the hardest things for me? Yeah. That at this age, to look back, and, and, I, and, I, and I, I've, I've shared it this way with other people before. It's not, that, it, it's not even that what I said was necessarily wrong, but my attitude and my tone and my demeanor was so unJesus like oh. I feel like there are times I got, need to go back and apologize to everybody who was in my youth group or in the church that I started when I first became a lead pastor. The grace that we have to extend then toward ourselves. What I'm thankful for is that God can use us idiots. Yes, sir. Me, not you. You're not. No, you're not well, you are, no, you're I'm a in the paragon. Line. I'm in but, the uh, line. Don't uh, worry. But, but that God can take me because I was willing and, yeah. and flawed. God still redeemed. People still got saved in my ministry work, and, and people still grew and then became leaders themselves. And it, was, it wasn't me. It was God right. in me. And God used my willingness and got through my stupid flaws and got through the things that I was weak at and, and used me. Yeah. And I'm so that that right there. And that frees me up to step out in, in, in faith and work still. If yes. I if I if I focused on my mistakes, I could never serve again. Right. Because I would be bound up by this guilt. But God's grace lets me continue to work for him. Yeah. And that is such a blessing. So as you look at as you look at yourself today, and and, and it's just a little insight maybe into your own personal relationship and conversations with Jesus. Where, where are some areas that, that you hope and pray that he's going to work on at this point in your life? I think my biggest thing is the why. Um, I, Explain that. Okay, well, say, say for instance you're watching a, 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 a boxing match, and um, the boxer was trained, and they have some habits that are maybe bad habits in boxing. Yeah. And, but they, they're trained, and then they go in, and, they're, and, and they're, they're boxing just fine, and then they get punched in the nose just a certain way, and the, ha the habits come back. And they start boxing poorly again because of the instinct. Mm -hmm. And I'm fortunate in some ways in that I was raised to instinctively serve God. You yes. get up on Sunday morning, you go, you get to church, you do the things, you, you read your Bible, you pray, you're, 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 you try to be kind to people. But, you know, when we start getting in the battlefield, and, and by battlefield, I'm not going out to war. I'm not, you know, no one's trying to kill me for being Christian. But, but the battle of just daily life, yeah. sometimes I forget the why and just do the thing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I come to church, not because I'm here to be transformed, not because I'm here to meet God, but because that's what I do. Mm. I read my Bible because, well, that's what you do. You read the Bible. I'm faithful because I'm faithful because that's what you do. I, and, and that fake it till you make it thing, it has a value. Sure. But I let myself get there awfully quick sometimes. Uh. Um, I, I, I have made this joke, and it's not a joke, but I make it sound like a joke, is that I have, there, there are days where I'm a practical atheist. And by practical atheist, I mean that if you were to look at my day, would you know I'm not an atheist? Hmm. My thought process. Was my thought process that day a Christian thought process? I'm not, I'm not saying I was cursing God or right. killing babies or no, something. No, I hear you. But during my day, was God ever Lord of my life? Wow, yeah. And I have to, I have to confess, there's many days that way. I don't like it, but, you know, that goes back to that I'm not actively seeking God, and that's where I, I'm asking for a transma transformation through the Holy Spirit is to make less of those days. That's good. I, it, it doesn't go like that. No. But I, I ask for more days. You know, uh, you know uh, there's a guilt thing that goes with that in that I, um, I want to teach a Sunday school class mm -hmm. because I know I'll study my Bible more if I'm teaching a Sunday school class. Hmm. Well, shouldn't I be doing that anyway? Yeah. And so there's a guilt connected to service that I have to sort of disassociate. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you. that's my, my prayer is that God will transform me so my, my why is better. 
So Tim, he, here we are at, at such a, a brief but powerful time of conversation. We're right here at the end. But I, I want to give you just, just one, one last word here today. Um, you know, I, I shared a story last week out of the Bible that wasn't necessarily, that, that wasn't Ashley's story. Ashley's story was Ashley's story. But here was an individual whose life was really out of control and, uh, and, and needed transformation. Today, and, and some people can relate to that, but you know, that would not have been something that I related to because even though today I look and see I was out of control, let's say in my, in my teens, in my 20s, maybe even in my 30s early on, I would have said, no, 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 that's not me. What would you, just one last, just maybe encouragement to someone who has grown up in faith all their life but maybe hearing a deeper pull today from the Spirit of God to really cross over to make it theirs. What would you say to them? Wow. I, I, well, first of all, I would say get into the Word. Get into the Word. I read, read God's Word, and it transforms you. Yeah. And, and that sounds pithy. It sounds overly simplified. But it is amazing. And I mean, I went, one of the biggest transformations I had in my understanding of God's word is I just stuck a Bible tape, tape, cassette tape, in my car when I was in college. And my drive from, from work to school, school to home, I just had the New Testament going all the time. Mm. And it was amazing how much closer I got in my relationship with God just from hearing wow. his words. And, and, and it's, it sounds like magical thinking. But I'm okay with that. But I'm okay with that. Yeah. So, so, so to the person that might be just your admonition would be, how about how about take a deep dive, into or the a word shallow of God. dive? Get your toes wet. I mean, you, you'll be amazed how he'll pull you in. Yeah. Um, and just having maybe someone guide you on how to do it, because I I know lots of people who started the Book of Matthew and got stuck in the. Uh, the genealogies. genealogies yeah. Right. <laughs> or you start in Genesis, you get that creation story, that's cool, and then you get the genealogies, oh, I'm done. And so having some guidance, uh, yeah. get some guidance from someone who's been down the road on how to read God's Word, yeah. and then go read God's Word. You know, I've often found that, you know, for me, one of my encouragements to people, particularly where, wherever they may be, maybe struggling a little bit, maybe not knowing... What, I even just tell people, get in the book of John. Yeah. Yes. Fall in love with Jesus. Absolutely. Look at his conversations with people. Look at how he deals with people. And remember that that is a love letter to you. That is letting you know that this is who Jesus, what, what he can mean to you, do for you, do through you. Just fa fall, fall in love with him by by reading about him. You know, one of the things, not to put words in your mouth, but one of the things that I really find is, is that you learn in all those encounters with Jesus, you learn you don't have to hide from him no. oh. because of your mistakes, because of your failures, because of whatever, however you would label yourself, whatever you've done, all these, uh, you know, because you re realize that's, what he came to do is to help people just like you. And you don't have to hide from the one who gave his life to set you free. You can't hide. Well, no, you can't. But so why we do we try. Why do you think well, you can? can? Right, right. <laughs> How good. How good. Tim, I, I want to thank you today. I know that there is... Uh, here, I'll, I'll, you're going to, guess what? I'll, I'll hold on to this okay. now, but before you go, I just want to say thank you. I just want to say that I appreciate your faithfulness to the Lord. And for those of you that, that don't know, we, we've had many years now to talk about how a teacher, with certain constraints, of course, because of profession, still finds ways for the beauty of Jesus to be seen by students. 
And I thank God for you. I thank God for all of our teachers. Many are going back to school tomorrow for the first time, interacting with students in a different way. And I want you to know that if you will listen and you will ask, Jesus will show you beautifully creative ways for the message of his life to flow through your classroom to where students just might ask you what this is really all about.